So now we have the LED board produced and ready to go. Uh, we've got a GBA console here. Uh, we've done the first thing, which is just basically to place the board over the GBA and make sure things align, which they look like they do. So next up is to solder all the components and do a review, make sure there's anything, if we need to improve, we improve before we go to manufacture, um, as well as make sure the device actually works. Uh, I've got a resistor book here for resistors for the LEDs. Uh, I've got the three components, the um, the NOR gates, the N-channel MOSFET, and the D-type flip-flop uh, in the right footprint for this board. Uh, and then I've got a bunch of LEDs, and we'll just scatter some random color LEDs on this board. So let's just chuck this together uh, and hope for the best. If there are any issues on the build, which happens often, but this is a pretty simple design, so hopefully there's not going to be many issues, um, we will diagnose them live and get it working. So the idea is by the end of this video, we'll have this board up and running and we can see what it's like and we can place the production order and start selling these. So let's just dive in and start soldering. So let's first just take a look around the fit of this board. So because we made it pretty much the shape of all the outlines, it should be fairly easy to align and take a look at. So we can see that those pads line up good. I can see straight away one issue here, minor issue, but I've accidentally gone over these resistors here. Um, so I will move that um, row here up slightly. Uh, it's going to be a flex board, so it's not going to cause any issues, but it's, it's obviously not accurate. So we'll fix that. That's one minor note. Um, another thing I've noticed here straight away and then remembered, uh, if you know the clean screen for the Game Gear, the flex ribbons started off as circles, and then I changed them to half moons. Uh, the reason for that is it's actually really difficult to remove a solder when it's completely covered in a ring versus it being um, a half moon. So for ease of removal, what we should really do is make these half moons. So I'm actually just gonna snip these now, considering this is the prototype, just so you know what I mean as well. I'm gonna snip them, and there's no, um, and there's obviously no circuit board uh, around here. There's no wiring uh, above there because we designed it and we know otherwise we'd be cutting through potential traces. Uh, the same on this one. There's no um, there's no wires at the edge. So if I can just get in, this one's a bit more difficult to get in. If I can just get in to snip that edge off a little bit, that would be ideal. There we go. Something like that will give us the visual. And that's what we'll do on uh, the next revision. I will just change the shape of those holes to be pre-cut out. So down here, that looks nice and accurate. You can see it goes over the holes. Uh, it goes over these buttons here, which is nice. Goes through here, hits that hole fine. It's all four of these fine. The trigger looks okay. Now you can see that it goes around the trigger. Um, this is quite thin, however, this kind of connection here that we've made, this arc here, looks a bit mm, not great. So I'll try and thicken that up on the next revision as well. Uh, that's going to be hard to get solder to attach to. So we'll probably just make it like a sort of a V instead of a, a half moon to get more. So we'll have like a V of copper up here maybe. And then it'll make attaching solder to that much easier. But position wise, it looks fine. Come along here, we're going to move that up as we mentioned. So that's three little amendments so far. Then if we look at the power connectors, they again line up fine. Uh, however, similar to the other one, I think what I'll do is make these just flats uh, with a big rectangle of copper on the edge, and I'll make this one probably expand the full width of this double pad. Uh, so I'll probably just come down here and go flat across. This will work fine, but I just know now looking at it, it's going to be nicer uh, if it's just a flat rectangle. Uh, this will avoid the shell because the shell line, as we checked, goes on this white line and we're inside the white line as we expected. Uh, we miss this connector, which is right. And then here we line up nice and accurately with all the buttons and the same up top here. 
So I reckon all the alignment is fine. That's pretty much where I'd expect to see everything. So there's only a few minor tweaks that we want to do. We want to correct these circles to half moons. Uh, we want to nudge this bar up to avoid the resistors and we'll change these to flats here. So other than that, I think we're good to go. So let's just take it off this board and let's start just soldering up. So all the resistors for now, I'm just going to chuck on an average of say 160-ish ohms for all the resistors. So I'm just going to solder everywhere there's the small uh, resistor next to the LED all over the board. Um, all here and here and here all the way over. I'm just going to chuck on resistors all over here. So I'm going to use my 0402 resistor book. We sell these on the store if you just want to be able to grab any value resistor you like. Uh, and I'm going to go with uh, about a 160. So I'm just going to take this out. I think we've got 10 LEDs on the board. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we need 10 of these. That allows me to lose a few as well. So let's solder these on first. So you're just gonna blob solder on one of the pads. If you get it on two, it doesn't matter. It just helps it stay flat if you get it on one. And then hover the resistor over. You can see this tip is on its way out, it's wanting to keep far too much solder on. And that's one resistor on. Pad the other. And considering this tip is a bit shoddy at the minute, I'm just going to hot air these resistors on. Makes it quicker and easier. There's another one on. <clears throat> I'm just going to repeat this for all of the board now. Now to put the LEDs down, uh, you'll notice all the LED pads have this little line here, either side. So one side has basically got a broken line. If you take the actual LED itself, you'll notice one side's either got a dot, which indicates it should face towards that line, or on the underside, you'll have an arrow, and the arrow should point towards the line. So in this case, our LED wants to go on facing this way. Obviously turned upside down to solder, but when you turn it upside down, you'll see that the green dot is also the same thing. So some LEDs have a green dot, some have a arrow, some have both. But basically we want that side going towards this um, line. Just tin one side, Grab the LED, you can tack it in place and then you can warm up and get further over. And just position it by eye until you're happy and then add solder the other side. This soldering iron tip as you can see is really starting to wear out the signs or when you put solder on. You can see it's not going to the tip of the iron, it's just going to roll up so the actual tip of the iron i'm trying to use down here is no longer accepting solder and it's just rolling up the tip so i'm working with a, a tip that really needs to be swapped but for now uh, it's a simple enough job so go ahead and solder all of the leds on so now we have the leds and the resistors i've just scattered random colors on here and over here we've got the leds and resistors so the only area left now is to focus on this control area here. So we'll start with these two uh, DFN chips, these fine pitch chips. They're not that hard to solder, you will need a hot air gun. Basically just take um, your solder first and cover the pads, get them all tinned. Like that. 
And if we just clean off the used flux from the solder. And we apply some fresh flux over the top. And we'll start with the top one, the Norgate. And I just take this out of its packet. You'll see that it's a small component. And if you flip it over, again, you've got to get the orientation right. So from here, you can tell there's a dot of kinds on the top left, whether you can now see that or not. So you can just about see the dot there. Uh, that normally would probably indicate uh, the correct corner. And if we move this out of the way, even though there's flux on here now, see that little white dot down there? So this little white dot here indicates on our board that's pin one. So this chip that's going here, this dot is linked to this chip. The one at the bottom, you've got a dot here at the top left. So this bottom one here has pin one at the top left. And this NOR gate at the top here has pin 1 down the bottom right. So to find pin 1 on this chip, there's normally an indicator which is that dot, which is not 100% definite. But if you don't see them on small chips, if you flip it over, you'll normally find that one of these pads has a marking. So you can just about see that this pad here, this corner pad, is missing the very edge of... Uh, the pad, so it's shaped slightly different. So the others are rectangles, and that top right pad now, you can see how it's slightly got a piece missing. So that means if we turned it all the way over now, this top corner pad here will end up at the bottom corner here where we want, and that would indicate uh, the pad one is in the right position. So if we did this, we now know that chip's in the right orientation. And if we could see through all the uh, solder, uh, all the flux, you'd probably see that that dot is also now at the bottom right. So I'm just going to hot air this into position. And then if you're unsure about whether it's soldered or not, you can generally take a look at the sides. And you can see it's soldered there and just excess solders bled out. So we can just get the soldering iron with a bit of flux. And just free up that excess solder. Same for the other side. You can just look down the side and see if it looks okay. Which to me that looks okay. Looks like it could possibly twist slightly. But if we just take a look at the part on the board itself, you'll find that it looks like it's in position, it's between the two lines. So of all the hot air sort of QFN BGA type chips, these Exxon chips with just two rows are the worst for naturally aligning. So normally these would just flow perfectly into alignment. Some of these struggle to align, but I can tell from that, that's fine. You don't need to overwork it. The pitch of these pads uh, is quite large in comparison, and I know that's not going to be bridging. So we should be good with that one. Now let's chuck on the D flip flop, which is the same footprint again, just that we've got to put the chip the other way around. So same principle here, uh, look on the bottom, we can see here the top right pad has a little notch out, which means we should just have to flip this over horizontally. That way, and we can just hot air that into position the same. So probably put a bit of flux there so it blows it into position. Lift that off.
and you can see that chip much more easily aligns. So you see when I blow it, it moves and then it just naturally goes back to center. So that chip aligns much nicer than this chip. So that one I'm pretty confident is in position without checking. So let's just do a check. And you can see that one is bang on alignment. You can tell by the footprints on it. So that's now the two difficult chips on. What do we have left? We have 10 microfarad capacitors here and 180K resistors. And they are to give the delay to the button press. We have a transistor here, uh, an N MOSFET. And then we just have two pull-up resistors here, which need to be anywhere from 10K to 100K. So let's just go and chuck on the transistor. So for that, I will just turn the top right pad. Bring the transistor in. And using my really worn out soldering iron tip, I'll attack it in place. Blob solder there, go to the other side. And blob solder on both legs. Let's clean that up. Chuck the capacitors up here. There we go. And now let's just get 180k um, resistors and say 70, uh, 47k resistors for the bottom ones. So, bottom ones we'll do first. And these are just pull-ups to disable the set and reset pads of the D flip-flop. So the value isn't important. There's the pull-ups. And the last two are the 180K resistors. And again, this isn't crucial. This is just the time variant. So the higher the resistor, the longer it will take to hold the start and select before things trigger. So you can increase the resistance or increase the capacitor size and either will give you uh, a delay longer with a higher value. That's it, and I'm just gonna put a bit of flux over all of this area and just hot air the area in general just to reflow these pads because my soldering iron tip is terrible at the minute so I don't trust these connections very much. And you can see there everything flows into place. Give it a clean up. And we should be good to test this board now in a console. So now let's place this on the actual console and solder it into place. So if we look at where we want to solder these, uh, we want to probably pre-tin TP2 and 3. We probably want to pre-tin the triggers for easy soldering. So let's just do that first. Obviously TP2 on this has already had some of on. This is probably had a... Uh, LED kit on, using it as a select button. TP3, pre-tin that. The cage, just pre-tin that. And same for the other cage. I 
and that should do for the pretens. Now let's just place this board on and you can really position it over sort of this corner. It's a nice easy way to position like that. But if I just pre-tin this pad first again, so now it's ready to tack in position. We can, in fact, it's nearly exactly on position. I think there we go, maybe slightly over. Check all the way over the other side. And that aligns up pretty well as well. So I think we're good there. What we could do is then tack this extreme edge over here. So it's the different ends of the board. Probably should have pre-tinned this while I'm holding it in position. There we go. So that's now held in position. We can check the fit everywhere lines up, which it does. And now it's just a case of soldering these pads in. So you can see this pad definitely has room for improvement. It's a long way away. Well, I'll say a long way away. It's longer than I'd like. Um, and it's a very, very thin piece of um, copper on the board. So making that jump between there and there is not going to be easy. And in fact, I will probably either just really over blob this with solder um, or I'll just use a bit of wire to bridge that gap. So there we luckily got it. But that's one of the places we're going to improve. We're going to make it closer and a lot more copper. Uh, down here, the only other pad to solder is the start button, TP3. And again, bear in mind, this is a 0.4mm circuit board, so it's quite thick. When we go into production, mass production, um, this will be a lot thinner. This will be 0.17mm thick, so you won't have this thickness. So I think that's all there is to solder down here. Select and the start test buttons uh, and the ground pad up there, which is just purely an anchor. Over here, we have these two pads, so the 3 volt and the 5 volt input. So again, these pads I'll improve, because they are, again, very thin pads with not much copper, but it's done the job for now. And on here, it's already done, I'll just reflow it. And now we've lost the connection. There we go, I think that's got it for now. So those are in, again, something for definitely improving, but it's a nice, easy fix. There's no need to overthink that for now. Uh, and then finally, this is the actual ground connection that we make. So this is the one that provides ground to the system. So it's important we do get this connection um, fairly solid. So I'm just getting to a good position for soldering. I'm just going to use plenty of solder. Of course, I've got the world's worst soldering iron tip as well at the minute. Everything's against me on this one, but still managed to do it. And there's the ground connection. So I think that's it for the first uh, prototype. So let's now fire this up, see if it works. Give it a little clean around the areas we've soldered. And let's see what we get. Let's fire up the bench power supply. Set it to three volts. Grip on there. Uh, grip on the three volts underside. That's annoying. Let me just solder a wire onto the positive so it's not holding the board in the air. So, that out the way. Can now grip on there, hopefully. And there we go. So we can turn the console on. Another moment of truth, I guess. 
If we hold over here for two seconds, does it turn off? Nope, so let's just zoom into here. These are the set and reset pads, so let's just tap on here, see if these work. There we go, so the set turns on, the reset turns off. So there's a nice little quirk of using CMOS inputs and a set and reset. We can actually test that all the LEDs are working, and we can also test that effectively the D flip flop circuit's working because when we tap on, and tap off it's activating the transistor so we have some kind of issue could just be bad soldering the leds will work which is good um we know that this d flip flop is working because this set and reset turn the lights on and off we know the transistor is working because that's the thing turning them on and off uh, so now we just need to scope what's wrong potentially with this this is the chip i said didn't sit very well could just be bad soldering by me um, so we could just reflow the chip, but we also have an oscilloscope, so we can just take a look at this and see what's going on. So we've got the scope up. Let's just connect the probe to ground. And let's take a look at what's going on here. Get into a good position a minute. Hmm. Maybe the cage is a better ground. There we go. So we've got that on cage. Uh, we have on the design here, uh, the input one here and input two here. So start and select. These should be three volts. And when we press the buttons down, they should slowly drop. So let's just hold on to that one. And with the rubber, I'm gonna press uh, the select button down there we go, you can see that drops. I'll let go. So if I just move out so you can see what I'm doing. So testing on that pad. And I just press the select button down. And you can see it drops. And let go. The start shouldn't do anything there because that's not the start pad. If I then put the probe on the resistor of start. And press the start down. You can see the starts going low as well. So the next is to check um, the combined output. So what happens is obviously uh, these are working now, resistor and capacitor combo. The two inputs are going in slowly. The output, uh, if I remember from when we drew the schematic, is this is the output pin here that goes down and into the D flip flop. So this pin here, which interestingly touching it with the probe set it off because it's the clock input. So in a way it would. But if I just connect to that via and get this back onto ground, that does not like being on ground. What we should see is when I press both buttons down for a period, the OR gate should go high on this pin. So if we look at the scope, and I just zoom out for you again, and I hold down on both buttons, you can see that it's gone high, and I let go, and it drops. And it's actually turned the LEDs off this time, so it's actually worked that time. So I hold on, goes high, let go, it drops. So we have the clock working. So it would seem like everything is going into or out of the NOR gate correctly. So the NOR gate's doing what it should do, converting two slow inputs to one risen output. The D flip-flop is working in the sense that the set and reset work and the transistor works, and the only thing left is uh, the clock impulse that we've just seen. So is something going on with this clock line? Do we have noise on it maybe? Let me just set up a trigger and see if we can actually see anything going on. And we'll set this nice and fast on the speed. And let's see if we can capture the clock trigger happening. So, I 
Ah, and there we go. Let's just pull up that clock pulse one second. So look at that. That is a very unclean clock rising. Now that should be a fast rise. And in terms of time, I guess it kind of is fast. Um, this one grid here is 50 nanoseconds, which is fast. So this is about a 20 nanosecond rise. However, it's quite a noisy rise. So that's gonna be triggering all kinds of noise on the clock signal. It needs to be a very clean signal. So I think the reason that's happening um, is because uh, we need a termination resistor, basically. And that's usually only needed on really high speed devices. But because the data sheet of the D-type flip-flop, with it just being simply um, a flip-flop, one of the most common lowest denominators in electronics, it can work really, really, really fast. So the D-type flip-flop can trigger on a clock pulse, I believe, one nanosecond. So 50 times within this little area here, it could trigger. So that means it's likely gonna be triggering at least five to 10 times on this little bit of noise here. So, you normally see termination resistors on high-speed clock lines. And we're kind of forgetting this is also technically a high-speed clock line. Even though it's really slow and we only wanna trigger it on a single clock, we are using the clock um, to trigger, and that clock is a high speed, or potentially high speed clock. So looking at this, we need a resistor between um, the NOR gate and the D-type flip-flop. Luckily, this gap looks big enough here to fit a resistor in. So if we just scrape away, The resist here and then we just want to break the trace There's the break. And now as you want to do is, if we sold to say, I don't know, a 10K resistor between there, we should be good. And the resistor will just dampen the signal because it's then gonna absorb the current. And it effectively terminates the line. So it's called the termination resistor. I just get a 10k resistor out of my sample booklet. And if we just chuck that resistor on top here. that side and that's the other side looks like I've got it and just clean up and test with a multimeter that that isn't shorting still so either side of here should not be shorting which it's not and the resistance should be about 10k, otherwise it's not connected at all. Yep, and we have 10k there. So, that little patch is fine. <clears throat> Let's see if that's actually fixed our issue. And uh, Let's just turn on the console again. And let's hold down on the buttons. And there we go, lights come on, hold again, lights go off, perfect. So we have a slight issue on the design that's an easy fix, it's to add a resistor. 
But as you saw, um, you can see at the minute, that was the previous capture at 50 nanoseconds. So let's now see, we can tell it's fixed because we're using it and it's working. But let's have an hour grip on and see what this termination resistor is doing to the signal. So we grip on ground. This probe really does not want to grip on ground. Right, so we go there and we go down to here. And this time we touch on the bottom side of the resistor where the new connection is. And I will start up the scope again. And I'll press on the buttons. And you can see there now, if I show you that capture, you can see it's very, very, very slow rising in the sense of nanoseconds. So that termination resistor of 10K has slowed down the instantaneous but choppy rise to now a smooth rising signal that takes about 400 nanoseconds to rise, which is nothing um, in long term. That's still really, really, really small amount of time, uh, but it's fixed the issue. So you can see the problem and you can also see the solution. So other than some minor tweaks, we want to change the shapes of these pads, um, make the ground pad a bit better, move this up slightly and add that termination resistor. Uh, this appears to be a working product. Now we've obviously got to test the fit inside of a console as well to make sure it closes and that the buttons work. But because these are thicker boards, I'm going to expect them to be a little bit harder to um, actually use. But I know from previous projects um, and working on these with Xboxes and Playstations in the past that a flex ribbon is going to be perfectly fine with LEDs on going under the buttons. So I'm not too worried about that. So let's just take a look at this in a front shell. And we can see here, or I can see here, the ground point on the trigger, where we soldered to, technically hits uh, the plastic there slightly. So you can see it hitting that ball of plastic. But you can also see here, by my thumbnail, that actually the plastic of the console shell has already hit the circuit board, so it's not going to go any lower. So even though that looks like it's actually... An impact it stops right on the joint and it's also going to be a slightly thinner board so overall that's actually not going to be an issue this side however does want to stick up quite a bit at the minute you can see we've got rock there basically so we want to figure out why that is and I think that is purely the bridge between the white and green area of the shell where we can see it rocking over like that now my shells have got cutouts here so we could technically come down and across but on the original shells that doesn't have that movement so you're going to always hit this arm anyway and again because this is going to go right the way down to 0.1 about 0.18 millimeter from 0.4 that kind of rock and pressure is going to be non-existent it's only because it's pressing on there. So to just check if it's that or not, I'm just going to snip off um, a little bit of that. And if that is the only thing getting in the way, this would now be flat. And there we go, it's completely flat now. So there's no rock. So the only impact we appear to have... Um, or still will have in essence is this little bridge going under uh, which like I mentioned due to the fact that um, other shells and original shells don't have this cut out down here anyway I'm not going to move my design down here um, I might do to be honest um, I'll have another look but if not when you get the flex ribbon it won't be too thick to sit under that uh, and real worst case if somebody's really finicky about that being super flat there uh, they can just nip out a tiny bit, but you shouldn't have to cut anything there. It, sh it should sit pretty flat without that. So that's in the shell. So let's have a look what it looks like with some buttons. So let's just grab some 
clear buttons here, chuck them in the shell. Get the D-pad over there. Set. Now let's place the board in. And let's turn it over. So there's the buttons and triggers in. Let's try and just do this with the bench power supply. And we can see, look at that. So you can see the LEDs shine through fine. Uh, the triggers will point sideways, so they'll shine up and through, even though they do anyway. Um, the A and B are fine. The start and select are fine. I'd just be tempted on the D-pad to... Um, do something different with that the d-pad doesn't really shine so we might and this could be because it's a clear shell but to me that d-pad is not really glowing at all um so if you imagined it wasn't in a clear shell you'd have the buttons lit up nicely like that they would clearly light up nicely but i'd be tempted to go um on the inside ring maybe of the d-pad Hmm. Yeah, so the D-pad definitely wants some thought. So let's just take a look at that. And the only issue we have with the D-pad is when you push the D-pad in, you do have this ball here that on some designs almost touches the circuit, so you can't go within that little ring area. Uh, we should also probably cut our board out, to be honest. Our board, even though it's thin, we should probably move these wires away from the centre and cut out a circle in the centre so that this ball could fully touch the bottom of the circuit. Uh, but I think we want to move um, the LEDs to the inside, not the outside. Because originally I didn't want to hit this ball, but we can see uh, if we just put the rubber on. We can see there, if we put the LEDs on the inside here, we're going to be clear of that issue. So I reckon we move the LEDs to the inside on the D-pad um, and we're going to have a much better light up because these outside ones don't light. So there's a bunch of things we need to improve. I can do all them and I'll push this live so everybody can get the updates. This is a fully open source project by the way, so you're welcome to take the designs, make them, design your own from them, tweak them, do whatever you like. But now I'd say this is basically the finished design. Uh, all these minor tweaks I can do offline no problem and I'll push them live onto the Git repository so you guys can see them. And I'll do a kind of install video after this of the final flexible board. Uh, but hopefully you've learned enough from this project to make this yourself. And you can see the first prototypes and how you have to debug issues, how you spot problems like lights that you're never really going to tell until you've made a board and then you look at it and, you know, revise the issues. You install one and find out where you can make the solder pads better. Um, and then you just design again and go until you're happy. So with those small tweaks in mind, I'm happy with this project. Um, we have something unique, uh, which is nice and handy, that if you want an LED project, but you don't want all the hassle of the lights being on permanently, then you can have this soft on and off feature, whereby you just hold the start and select button for a few seconds to turn them on and turn them off as you desire. So it's not wasting battery all the time but you can turn on the LEDs whenever you like. So hopefully you've enjoyed this project, and I'll see you in the next one.